Welcome to the good, the bad and the ugly. With a mighty have fallen, the good get ugly and there's no such thing as bad publicity. This time, we marvel at the mettle of five determined celebrities who battle their way back from the brink. In February 2007, media commentators and healthcare professionals weren't holding out much hope of a Britney Spears revival. Britney Spears' prognosis, unless she gets the right kind of treatment, is dire. Her situation is most likely going to escalate. You know, she cut off her hair. She got a tattoo. Well, you know, there are forms of mutilation. Some people carry it further and they actually cut themselves. Eight months later, custody of her two sons, Sean Preston and Jaden James, was being handed to her ex-husband, Kevin Federline, after she was ordered to undergo random tests for drugs and alcohol. Britney's spectacular rate of self-combustion was documented in an exhibition in LA. Just two years earlier, it had been reports of K-Fed's hard partying ways that had made the headlines. Kevin loves to go out and party. He'll hang out with his friends till all hours. He'll bring people back to the house. And he has been spotted frequently hanging out with strippers and girls at clubs. Cast in the role of Love Rat and leaving Britney holding the baby, fans were very vocal in insisting she dump the ex-backup dancer of a parasite who was frittering away her fortune. But by February of 2006, after giving birth to her first baby, Sean Preston, she'd begun compiling her own impressive catalogue of gaffes and bungles. Two months after driving with Sean Preston in her lap, there were reports that he had fallen out of a high chair and cracked his skull. Not long after that, she was snapped almost dropping him as she emerged from the Ritz-Carlton with a drink in one hand. Amid rumours that her marriage to K-Fed was all but over, she announced she was pregnant again. Then came the dyed black hair, the pregnant nude photo and shots of her picking out on snacks and chocolate. By the time Jaden James came along in September, Britney's grip on reality looked shaky to say the least. Two months later, she filed for divorce from Kevin and the unravelling began in earnest. And who knows what Britney's are? Could be something from her childhood. Could be some kind of issue that she's currently involved with that she can't stand and she uses drugs to cope with it. Hitting the LA party circuit with Paris Hilton, photos of her in various stages of undress and intoxication became staple front page fare for gossip mags. She was voted worst celebrity role model in a news poll and she topped the year off by collapsing at Pure Nightclub on New Year's Eve. It appeared that Britney's only source of control came from a bottle. And at the launch of her third fragrance, In Control, the wild-eyed former teen queen from Louisiana looked anything but. In Control, my latest fragrance, which I absolutely love, is just out in department stores like Macy's everywhere now. In February 2007, after spending less than 24 hours in rehab, she embarked on the high-speed extreme makeover that proved to all and sundry that she totally lost the plot. After a California hairdresser refused to shave her head, Brittany grabbed hold of the clippers and performed her own buzz cut, before dashing round to the local tattoo parlour for some needlework. Over the next few months, she added a charge of a hit-and-run misdemeanor to her troubles and was snapped attacking a paparazzo with a brolly. Upon losing the kids to Kevin in October, some commentators were reading the last rites. Losing your kids and also in a very public way is traumatic uh, for anybody. And for a mother, uh, I, I, can, I can't even understand the, how it would feel because there's a whole different bond there than being a father. My hope is, and from people I've talked to, she's very fragile emotionally. I hope this doesn't send her over the edge. While her attorney was being paid to give a more positive spin. I believe that removing custody from Ms. Spears is the shock treatment that Britney Spears needs. Incredibly, however, she still had further to fall. Her love-hate relationship with the press had yet to spawn a bizarre interlude with a paparazzo named Adnan. 
and in January 2008, she had to be carted away to hospital for psychiatric evaluation before her father, Jamie, finally stepped in to pick up the pieces. Along with a sobriety coach, he shielded her from former manager Sam Lufty and mounted a gargantuan effort to get Britney back on her feet. Miraculously, by September, she'd won Video of the Year for her single Piece of Me and had announced the release date of her sixth studio album, Circus, and its lead single, Womanizer, which jumped straight to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. She solidified the comeback with a second consecutive number one single and a number one album. She looked in great shape as she posed for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, and her exclusive interview with OK! magazine gave more convincing evidence that Britney was back. When we sat down with Britney just a couple of days ago, she was alert, she was smiling, she was genuinely happy. She was very, very um, willing to answer any questions. We were actually at her house for over three hours just for the interview. We saw a side of Britney Spears that was a complete transformation from the Britney Spears we saw less than a year ago. For the first few years of his Hollywood career, Robert Downey Jr. managed to cover up his addictions to various drugs and alcohol, turning in rave-reviewed performances in films like Air America and Less Than Zero, and winning a BAFTA for his portrayal of Charlie Chaplin in 1992. But to those close to him, Robert was always a time bomb waiting to go off. He was born in New York in 1965 to performing parents and made his film debut as a puppy in his father's 1970 film, Pound. As a teenager, he landed small roles in films like Baby It's You and Tough Turf. On the set of First Born in 1984, he met and fell in love with a 19-year-old Sarah Jessica Parker. During their seven-year relationship, Robert's drug use spiralled out of control, and he made his first trip to rehab in 1987. Sarah did her best to tape up the lover she refers to as a leaky pipe, but she eventually gave up in 1991. Robert managed to hold it together until 1996, when it all caught up with him, and he was arrested three times on drug and gun charges. He was sentenced to three years probation, and for the next four years, he was in and out of prison and rehab. The fallout from his growing police record included missing out on starring in Woody Allen's film Melinda and Melinda, because he was such a liability that no company would ensure the production. He also ended up losing his Golden Globe winning job on TV drama Ally McBeal after getting into trouble again in 2001. Just when it looked like he'd blown his last lifeline, he was thrown a supporting role in the 2003 psychological thriller Gothica. This time, he held on tight, and his campaign to get back on track gathered momentum, thanks to his romance with the film's producer, Susan Levin. Susan was able to keep a close eye on him as producer on his 2005 movie, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. But he wasn't out of the woods yet, with producer Joel Silver still struggling to get him insured for the film. But Robert was reveling in his return to the limelight. It's kind of a love letter with a lot of backstabbing on the way. Um, but ultimately, they're all staying here at the end. That's a funny thing. People love talking smack about L.A., but we're all going home to our places here at night. His partner in the crime comedy was fellow former bad boy Val Kilmer. And if things went awry, the film's writer-director, Shane Black, would have had his hands rather full. There's this reputation uh, that he, both of them have. I, you know, that, that's the past. There was nothing on my set to indicate that they were anything other than consummate professionals. Thanks to such positive reviews, he was in everyone's good books again, and the job offers came flooding in. More than making up for the time he lost, Robert saw no fewer than 11 films released from 2005 to 2007. As well as supporting George Clooney in Good Night and Good Luck, he co-starred with Tim Allen in a remake of the Disney classic The Shaggy Dog and played a crime reporter in Zodiac. He was now getting enough distance on his former troubles 
that he was able to laugh about them on the promotional trail of his 2007 film, A Scanner Darkly. I had methods. these little f f fuzzy um, slippers. <laughs> <laughs> I had slippers. They were fantastic. Yeah. They were pink. Because I've, I've seen a, a, a couple tweakers in my life, and oftentimes, uh, as long as you're not going to be leaving the house for two weeks, you might as well put on some slippers. <laughs> so that really helped me dig into my character. <laughs> Aside from the 25 years of drug research I've been doing previous. <laughs> Life research, Robert. <laughs> I stand corrected. With his confidence fully restored, he set his sights on snagging his first mainstream leading role in over a decade and landed the title role in the big screen adaptation of Iron Man. Uh, I was surprised that I went after it as, as hard as I did, but in this case I had to and it paid off, I think. Having nailed that enormous challenge, he bravely put his hand up for the rather daunting prospect of playing an African-American in the Ben Stiller comedy Tropic Thunder. In just four short years, he'd gone from being an insurance risk to being the hottest property in Hollywood, and directors were falling over themselves to sign him up. One of those who got lucky was Guy Ritchie, who approached Robert to play Sherlock Holmes. In case you aren't aware, I had a hell of a summer. <laughs> and um, it's made me uh, much more viable to, to play a, a lead role than I might have in the past. And I, I thought the idea of Guy and the way uh, his directing style and his strengths with a kind of um, very staid, you know, iconoclastic period idea like this was just kind of a no-lose uh, situation. Mariah Carey is the only singer ever to have their first five singles go to number one in the US. And throughout the 1990s, during her time with Columbia Records, she remained the world's biggest selling recording artist. Her songwriting talent, incredible vocal range, and mastery of the so-called whistle register helped yield at least one number one single per year throughout the decade and four chart-topping albums. In the year 2000, she wrote songs for several movies and received the Billboard Award for Artist of the Decade. Then, at the age of 30, the walls began tumbling down. Mariah's popularity was already on the decline when she moved from Columbia to Virgin. Her relationship with singer Louis Miguel was on the rocks and she started posting messages on her website claiming she was overworked. In 2001, her semi-autobiographical film Glitter, an accompanying album, got panned by critics and audiences. One reviewer likened her attempts to act to someone who'd lost their car keys. It won her a Razzie Award. During an appearance on MTV's Total Request Live, she handed out lollies to the audience before launching into a strip tease. Later the same year, she suffered a physical and emotional breakdown and checked herself into hospital. In a later interview, she said, I was with people who didn't really know me and I had no personal assistant. I'd be doing interviews all day long, getting two hours of sleep a night, if that. At her lowest ebb, she signed to Ireland for just $20 million and embarked on the long, hard climb back to the top which culminated in the release of The Emancipation of Mimi in 2005. Well received by critics, it became the biggest selling US album of the year and earned Mariah a Grammy Award and the label of Comeback Kid. But she was having none of it. They can call me whatever they want. I never went anywhere and my real fans have always been here for me. And you know what? It's, it's a wonderful feeling and everything I have is um, it's because God has blessed me with, with this, and I'm thankful. And I'll always be grateful for what I have. She followed up the album with the most successful tour of her career. And upon scoring yet another number one hit with her single, We Belong Together, she was adamant that she hadn't been out to prove anything in taking more control of her career. You know what? To me, it's not about vindication, because my true fans have always been here for me. Um, it's anybody's career goes through a, peaks and valleys, and that's what it's about. And the bottom line is I'm a songwriter, I'm a producer, I'm a singer. That's what I do, you know, and there are other creative avenues I want to take. 
We Belong Together held the number one position for 14 weeks on the Hot 100, while another single, Shake It Off, sat at number two. The next single, Don't Forget About Us, took her number one total to 17, equaling Elvis Presley's solo artist record. Undaunted by drawing level with the king, she dared to pull past him three years later after netting an 18th number one single with Touch My Body from her album E equals MC Squared, leaving only the Beatles record of 20 number ones to beat. And honestly, as a female, you know, I feel like it's a very big accomplishment because it's not about competing, but seriously, there it, it is an historic moment because there has never been another female who's done this. So I'm grateful for that, and I hope that young girls out there listening know that obviously anything's possible. They can go through ups and downs, but never lose faith and just keep going. Buoyed by her unrivaled success and her 2008 marriage to actor Nick Cannon, she proved her point by putting her Razzie Award behind her and taking another bash at acting. Her change in approach to the task of playing a social worker in Push won the respect of her co-stars. She's very centered and, and, and she's listening, which is rare, you know, we see Mariah and she's giving, she's out there, but this is, she's listening. She's like listening, which is really important. And much to the surprise of the skeptics, she walked away from the role with rave reviews, with one critic branding her performance pitch perfect. Like Mariah Carey, Charlie Sheen knows all about ups and downs. The youngest member of a bona fide Hollywood acting dynasty, the pressure was on from the start. His father, Martin, had begun acting in the 60s and rose to fame as the star of Francis Ford Coppola's war epic, Apocalypse Now, in 1979. 20 years later, Martin was raking in the Emmy and Golden Globe nominations as President Hosiah Bartlett in the smash hit TV series, The West Wing, and raising awareness about the Bush administration's lack of environmental responsibility. Charlie also watched his older brother, Emilio Estevez, become a star of the 1980s in films like The Breakfast Club, St. Elmo's Fire and Young Guns as a member of the Brat Pack. Charlie got his first big break, starring with Martin in 1987's Wall Street. Following in his father's footsteps, he then starred in the Vietnam War film Platoon. Things soon took a downturn in his private life. In 1990, he accidentally shot his then fiance Kelly Preston in the arm. Three years later, his name was discovered in the little black book kept by Hollywood madam Heidi Fleiss. In Heidi's 1995 trial, it was revealed that he'd spent $50,000 on high-class call girls over one year. Things appeared to be looking up when he married former model and actress Denise Richards in 2002. The year after, he scored the role of Charlie Harper in the CBS sitcom Two and a Half Men, which was to make him one of the highest paid actors in television. However, by 2005, it was clear he hadn't been so successful at turning things around in his private life. While carrying their second daughter, Lola, Denise filed for divorce. A brief reconciliation and marriage counseling failed, and the couple split for good in April 2006, with Denise claiming that Charlie's crimes had ranged from hiding guns around the house and threatening to kill her, to becoming addicted to gambling, prescription drugs, internet porn, and terrorist conspiracy theories. Just when it appeared that Charlie's reputation had hit rock bottom, Denise suddenly scored an own goal by taking up with her best friend's ex. Despite claiming that Heather Locklear's 10-year marriage to Richie Sambora had already hit the skids, the media took a dim view of the relationship, conveniently taking the heat off Charlie. While Denise was figuring out how to claw her way back into favour, Charlie got down to the business of marrying real estate investor Brooke Mueller. And when Denise proposed to feature their two daughters in her new reality TV show, Denise Richards, It's Complicated, he wasted no time in trying to block her in the courts. No, you don't, you don't go to court and make a you know, stand to prevent that. Um, 
if you don't firmly believe in it. So, you know, it's just the situation where, the, you know, like I said earlier, the, the world is upside down sometimes. And you haven't you found just any, any compromise or anything on it? No, I think we should all just boycott the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Issue a mass boycott. <laughs> After years of being labelled Hollywood's most depraved reprobate, Charlie Sheen had cast himself in the real-life role of responsible family man and moral guardian. When Brooke gave birth to twin boys in March 2009, the resurrection looked complete. Winona Ryder forged her early career out of playing troubled young women in films like Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands and Girl Interrupted. Her fragile beauty and doleful eyes helped create the image of vulnerability and confusion. Once mistaken for a boy at school, her androgynous charms captured the heart of her Edward Scissorhands co-star Johnny Depp. During their three-year engagement, Johnny had the words Winona Forever tattooed on his arm. Around the time of their split, Winona's compassion was awoken by the plight of the class family, who lived in the town of Petaluma, where she grew up. Their 12-year-old daughter, Polly, had been kidnapped, and Winona offered a reward of $200,000 for her return. She was devastated when Polly was eventually found murdered, and dedicated her performance in the 1994 adaptation of Little Women to her. Winona bounced back from the tragedy and her split from Johnny and went on to star in many more major movies throughout the 1990s. But in December 2001, her friends and fans were left scratching their heads when the 30-year-old actress was arrested for shoplifting $5,500 worth of clothes and accessories from Saks Fifth Avenue department store in Beverly Hills. The security officers observed both visually and by video um, Ms. Ryder to remove uh, sensormatic tags, which are the security tags that are affixed to the clothing items and placed the items in a bag that she had, and then she was observed to leave the store without paying for the items. What happened next was even more shocking. The prosecution, determined to make an example of her, insisted the trial be televised, and in the paparazzi's crush to get the first pictures, Winona ended up suffering a fractured elbow. In another demonstration of the district attorney's might, she was denied the opportunity to enter a no-contest plea on misdemeanor charges. In the end, she was convicted of grand theft and vandalism and sentenced to three years probation and 480 hours of community service. But in 2004, the charges were reviewed and the felonies were reduced to misdemeanors. She was offered the lead in Woody Allen's 2003 film Melinda and Melinda, but like Robert Downey Jr., she was considered too much of an insurance risk by the producers and had to be dropped. Coincidentally, she was cast alongside Robert again three years later in the Richard Linklater film A Scanner Darkly. Having eased her way onto the comeback trail, she signed up for three more roles in 2007, including The Ten, a comedy about the Ten Commandments. Making no reference to Winona's failure to abide by commandment number eight, director David Wayne waxed biblical about his leading lady. Obviously, if you're a, if you're a guy my age, you, you know, worshiped Winona Ryder growing up. You know, she was the, our woman of fantasy. Then I'm, here I am directing her. She couldn't be sweeter, and she's awesome in the movie.